It's the Bird Emergency. I'm Grant Williams, and it's my pleasure to, every time we settle down to do a Bird Emergency episode, we get to speak birds, and I get to introduce you to somebody who is into birds. And um, bird nerd is usually a tag which attaches really well to anybody that we speak to, but today... I'm delighted to speak to someone who I've tagged an activist, a curlew activist, and it's Mary Col- Colwell speaking to me from all over, all the way over in the UK. And as I mentioned to Mary a minute ago, this will be our third bird emergency episode on curlews, but we've always talked about the Far Eastern curlew and the flyway on this side of the world before. But Mary, welcome to the show. Um, what what uh, began your great interest in curlews? Oh well, hello, Grant. Thanks ever so much for having me on. Um, oh gosh, you know, people say, "What what is it about curlews that does it for you?" And I, I, it's almost the hardest question people can ask because I'm not really sure. Um, I grew up um, in a place where where I would go walking often with my dad. They would have been there. Um, they still are there in far fewer numbers, but they're still there. So no doubt I heard them as I was growing up. I went walking, but I don't remember particularly noticing them then. Um, but I do remember um, much later on going to the Orkney Islands, which are the islands right off the very top of Scotland. Um, and there's quite a few curlews up there. And I, it was a bre- very fresh, cold, windy day in the spring. And a curlew flew across a little loch and there were some standing stones actually just down the road. And it was all very ancient and sort of deep timey. And the call of the curlew just seemed to set the landscape alive. And I think I became entranced with them from that moment on. So I I probably put that moment as my as my sort of epiphany. And a a trip to the Orkneys, it must be a, a highlight just in itself. Mary, can you? Give us an idea of the um, what the landscape is like there, and um, an an idea of of how many people are there. Yeah, no, the Orkneys are really special. So, if you ever come over this way, you know they're a bit of a trek, but um, boy, are they worth it. So, the Orkney Islands are the islands that literally just sit off the coast. It's an archipelago. Um, quite a few islands and the big one is called mainland and that's where most people live I actually don't know the population of mainland but it'd be a few thousand I imagine Um, but once you get off the mainland and you get the little ferries out to the smaller islands that are dotted all around um, the populations are in their low hundreds at the most Um, and the the Orkney Islands are like um, big wide flat uh, flat sandbanks just sitting in the sea if you like so when you when you're sailing through them they, they, people used to call them or do call them the sleeping whales because they're sort of low and round and they come out of the water a bit like a whale sort of breaching the surface of the water so to speak they're very fertile so they've been occupied by people for a long time there's a lot of standing stones and really ancient monuments burial mounds and so on there even really ancient villages which have still been preserved um pre-christian way pre-christian villages um so they're really magical from that point of view but because the way of life is quite slow paced in in the farming way of life is quite slow paced um it's uh, you know grass isn't cut for hay until later in the year everything's a bit more old-fashioned i suppose is, is a way of putting it or certainly not as intense as it can be further south um it gives a bit more space for wildlife so the the, the air is full of the call of birds. And um, when you go there, particularly at this time of year, the wading birds love the big fields, the big wet fields, the locks, the seashore. And, you know, I was there very, very recently. And the sound of curlews, oyster catchers, lapwings, skylarks, it just fills the air. So I think they're magical because they're full of human history and they're full of natural history. I mean, what could be better than that? So the Orkneys are different to the the sort of landscape that we often have portrayed when 
when we see TV series about the north and the offshore islands from Scotland of big jagged cliffs and and very inhospitable wind swept swept places. This is more like a a, a rolling grassland. You kind yeah, of uh, they really are different. They really and they feel different. They feel in a way they feel more Arctic, if you like. Um, so uh, the, the the landscape you're describing is the one that everybody thinks of as traditional Scotland, which is the Highlands, usually over in the west of the mainland of Scotland. So big mountains and quite dramatic locks and inlets, and it's all very dramatic. Um, but the Northern Isles tend to be low lying and very fertile. These these Orkney Islands further out. If you go beyond Orkney, you get to Shetland, and they're different again. They're much more rugged and more landy. Um, and if you go west off the west coast of Ireland, you've got all the Hebridean islands and they're different again. So um, don't think of Scotland as just being Glencoe and Torridon and places. They, it's a hugely diverse place. Well, we, we've taken the opportunity to um, to speak, Mary, because it's uh, it's Curlew Day coming up. World Curlew Day. <laughs> World Curlew Day coming up very, very soon. So... Uh, I've, I've featured, as I mentioned to you before, the uh, the Far Eastern Curlew a few times and the East Asia Flyway. Tell us about the curlews that occur in your neck of the woods and what's the migration path, where, where are the breeding grounds and what are the, what are the threats that are ever present for the bird in your part of the world? Okay, so loads of really interesting questions there. So, um, in terms of the uh, what what the, the we, we've got the Eurasian curlew, and the Eurasian curlew um, is our largest wading bird. I think it's it's pretty similar to your Far Eastern curlew, except the bill isn't quite as long. I mean, you're big in the bill department over there in, in Australia. The Eurasian curlew's bill isn't quite so long, but it's still pretty long. And um, it's brown and grey and, and creamy mottled on its plumage, about the size of a duck, really, with long legs and a big, long, stretchy neck. So pretty similar to yours. And I think the calls are kind of similar, but the, the Eurasian curlew just seem to have the most magnificent, bubbling, yearning type of call. Um, and uh, they nest, well, their range is right from the west coast of Ireland right the way over to the east of Russia. So they go right across the European continent. And in the northern part, they, they tend to occupy the northern part, um, and that's where they nest. But in the winter, when it gets too cold and inhospitable and frozen for them to stay there because they feed by sticking their long bill into sediments, they either, the, the whole of the sort of Eurasian curly population tends to come south for the winter. Now, some will go down to the sort of Mediterranean sort of area, but a lot come over to us, come over to Britain and Ireland and, the, and that west coast of France. Uh, that's where the winters are not quite so harsh. We've got lots of big estuaries and nice rich coastlines. Um, and so in the winter, the British coastline gets over 150,000 curly visitors from, from the rest of Europe, coming down from the more inhospitable places like Sweden and Norway and Finland. Uh, northern Germany, and they come and stay the winter with us. Um, so that's where they, that's how they move. So they move from the north down south and west and, and southern areas for the winter. Um, we have a very, and when I say we, the UK has a very large breeding population of the Eurasian curly. In fact, we have a third of the birds that breed in Europe, um, breed in Britain. Uh, and that's really bad news because <laughs> because Britain isn't very kind to curlews at the moment. So the main problems they face, when they come to, to nest, they go mainly into very worked landscapes because Britain, as you know, we're a small country with lots of people. There isn't a lot of just space that's just left to be. It's all worked and managed and farmed. And so they end up nesting either, whether it's in the highlands or in the lowlands, in, in working landscapes. And when we had a slower paced farming pre-war, that was OK because we didn't cut the hay until later in the summer. And by that time, they'd nested and had their chicks and then we could cut the hay. But things have changed, haven't they? You know, we all eat a lot more meat and dairy than we ever did before. 
there's lots of cows, there's a lot more people, so there's a lot more milk and meat in demand. And so those cows are fed silage over the winter months. So farmers cut silage, cut the grass to turn into silage to feed their cows from late April onwards. And that's exactly the time when the birds are nesting. So one of the big problems we face in Britain is the agricultural practices. Lots of machinery out early in the year, cutting grass, going over the land, and the chicks and the um, eggs get smashed up. Added to that, um, we have a very large number of what's called meso predators. So foxes, you'll be well aware of all this problem. Foxes, badgers, um, we have crows, buzzards, all sorts of uh, animals, stoats and weasels that um, that will eat the eggs and chicks of curlews and all ground nesting birds. And we and that's fine because predation is just a natural part of the natural world. But we have very large numbers of them because of land use. They've done really, really well in our very farmed landscapes. So there's huge numbers of meso predators and diminishing numbers of curlews and other birds. So there's high intensive predation pressure, high intensive farming. Add to that the other issues of a lot of land being taken out to plant trees for climate change mitigation. Supposedly, we can talk about that. A lot of it is just cash crop, really, for Sitka spruce plantations. Um, but that takes away land where they could nest. It also houses predators, which will eat them. Um, and we also have a lot of uh, ag leisure time uh, disruption to them. So a lot of disturbance from walkers, dog walkers, all that kind of stuff. The land is drained and it gets too dry for them to feed, whatever, you know, pile it on. <laughs> the curly puts up with all of it, really. Well, I'm always looking for good news uh, whenever we do an episode, Mary. So uh, have there been um, and partly as as a result of the sort of pressure that you put on by always putting the the curlew in the in the public eye, um, is agriculture generally um, waking up to the need to protect? Are farmers coming on board? Um, is the government um, aware, and are they doing? anything in particular or is it all down to individuals and and the bird groups i would say that we're in a really interesting transition phase at the moment grant i think i think all of those things i think as you know britain has just left the european union so we are now at a point where we are designing our own agricultural schemes to go into the future and a lot of pressure has been put on the government to make the agricultural schemes that will pay farmers in the future much more nuanced. So we can mould things around different species or habitats better than just species, actually. Um, so we can make sure what the curlew needs um, or try to make sure gets into the new agricultural schemes. I'm very involved in that process. Um, we can also uh, do things like... Um, talk much more constructively with farmers because I'm so keen that we don't see goodies and baddies here. There are no baddies out there wanting to kill all the curlews. You know, that just isn't the situation. It's just the system works against them. So we have to work together to change that system. And we're doing that. And most farmers, most farmers don't want to kill wildlife. Most farmers like wildlife on their land. But the system means they're under a lot of pressure to get as much out of the land as quickly as possible. So they can't always accommodate it at the moment. So if we can make their life easier and help them to help wildlife, then that seems to me eminently the most best way to go. So yes, good things are starting to happen. There's been a lot more awareness of curlews and other ground nesting birds. Um, there's a lot more understanding of the pressures. There's a lot of discussion about predators, which is never an easy topic to talk about. Um, there's a lot of sensitivity about controlling predator numbers, but we have to talk about it. We have to be open and we have to say, you know, what do we want from our landscapes? Do we want lots and lots of ground nesting birds as well as everything else? Or are we, you know, going to let them go? Those conversations are starting to happen. So I see all that as positive. But we have to get a move on because these birds are declining so fast. And let me give you a couple of eye-watering statistics. In the 1980s, Southern Ireland, 
well, let's call it the whole of, of Ireland, the island of Ireland, that's the Northern Ireland and the Southern Ireland, Pro had 10, probably 10,000 pairs of curlews. Now maximum, maximum Southern Ireland has 130 and Northern Ireland has about 150. So what, 300 pairs of curlews in the whole of the island of Ireland left. So there isn't a lot of time you know, I was got the bird report from a county called Shropshire, which is um, one of the western counties in England. Shropshire. Um, Shropshire. Um, we had a beautiful ad uh, over here. Um, I can't remember what it was what it was uh, advertising, but there was this very camp black guy, um, and he was um, talking to to a, a woman, and I think it was about. Might have been about tea or something, and, <laughs> and 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 she and she she said, you know, that classically ignorantly racist thing like, "Oh, do they have this where you're from?" And he went, "What Shropshire?" <laughs> <laughs> well, now you know then Shropshire, yeah. and um, yeah, so Shropshire, this group, uh, there's a couple of really good active groups working on curlews there. And uh, in the northern part of Shropshire, there's one group that were monitoring 100 nests. That's a lot for southern England. That's mm, a real hot mm. spot. And they were monitoring the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the fate of these 100 nests. And let me ask you, how many nests do you think fledged, well, hatched, maybe, uh, yeah, fledged chicks? How many nests out of 100 do you think fledged chicks? Uh, look, I'm, I'm always on the... Uh... On the dark side of these numbers, I think, Mary, I'd I'd be saying probably 15, 20. Mm, one. <laughs> oh, you are kidding. Wow. 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 Mm -hmm. What um, I think um, Yeah. So that's that's uh, a that's a demonstration of how serious we are. And and I think we have very short um memories in in human history. Yeah. We lost the Eskimo curlew, which yeah which by reports along with the passenger pigeon were they were they were possibly two of the most common species to have lived in, in that hemisphere in the americas um of of any birds they were the most common and both of those are gone mm. um and just uh, and Again, clearing clearing the land, and uh, they were being harvested for food, which was two something that two million a year they were shot. Yep, yep. Which mm. um, it it's and it was so quick. And I think that I think from the time that they noticed a, a population pressure, I think it was about forty years before they were basically gone. Mm. So the numbers are no guarantee of success, and so and it happens very very quickly. So we've gone in Southern Ireland from five, six, seven thousand pairs to one hundred and thirty in thirty years. So they will go so fast, and now we're clinging on to the last few pairs. You know, we've let it get to that state, and that's why I go on and on and on about it. That's why I'm so determined to keep them in the public eye keep the pressure on because it will go and they will be gone and it, then it's too late far easier to hang on to what you've got than try and reintroduce them at a later date we can't you know not on my watch that's what i think not on my watch not if i can help it and the whole idea of reintroduction and whatnot seems to be um a, a very poor strategy because I don't think that curlews would would be a very good candidate for large scale captive breeding. Well, it's interesting because um, what's happened for the last couple of years is something called head starting. You're aware of that term. Head starting is where you go out into the field and you collect all the eggs you can find. So you go, you know, you go to an area where you know curlews are nesting and you just mm. take every single egg that you can find. Don't leave any, you know, because they're going to get eaten anyway. Yeah. Yep. Bring them all in, raise Incubate them. Incubate them. Yeah. Yeah. Wait till they're at fledging stage and then you put them back out there. And uh, we've tried that now, Royal We, not me, but the people that I know. Um, that has been tried now for two, three years. 
Um, and we're waiting the results of how successful that is. And we're beginning to see the birds, these ringed, fledged, uh, captive bred birds are around. We don't know whether they bred successfully yet. This this might be the first year if they're allowed to breed and we can protect them. But it but it is a last resort, isn't it? That's that's last chance saloon. When you start doing that, when you start head starting, you kind of just about to run the white flag up the pole and say we give in because it, it it's a, an expensive, time consuming last ditch effort to save a population. And it just all it does is buy you time. It's not a solution, but it buys you a bit more time. And when when you think of the expense involved in a program like that, and then the risk still involved that you're putting fledglings out where predation can still occur, it makes you think about the solutions that never really seem to be um, contemplated. And I I'm not sure why they aren't, but paying farmers to leave pastures fallow so they could cycle through areas of their property or, or actually in farming communities and you could pay people to leave the grass as grass for one season and then another another season. That to me would seem to be probably a, a cost-effective way if people are having to March every field, looking for eggs, then incubating, watching them. It just seems that the labour would would stack up with the opportunity costs of leaving um, leaving pastures fallow. Um, is anything like that being considered? Yes, absolutely. And that's when I was saying earlier that, you know, these new land management schemes, the new agricultural subsidies, that's exactly the kind of thing that's being talked about. So how do you make it worthwhile uh, for a farmer to leave a, a field where we know curlews are nesting? And I heard just today that um, there's a f big dairy farm up in Cumbria and the farmer has few pairs nesting on his fields, but he's gone and rolled the fields anyway. And so the, all those nests are gone again. And so what is it that we have to do that that farmer thinks, actually, it's <clears throat> it's worth my while to keep those birds there? So that's the kind of thing that we need to talk about. How do we pay farmers uh, to, to protect wildlife, um, but still feed the nation and still yeah. allow farmers to be farmers? You know, it's a, it's a big question, isn't it? Mary, when I was at school and doing economics at, at uni, um, the the mythical EU mountains of cheese, the you know the warehouses full of product that will never be sold, um, were were common uh, stories. I don't know if it if it was apocryphal, but that was the kind of things we heard about with agriculture in Europe. Do you know if the the farmer you just mentioned is he um let, let's generalize that example is he generally making money as a farmer or is his existence and his livelihood already being effectively paid for subsidized by the british state uh, well, the, the, all farmers get subsidies, depending on the sort of land they're in and the sort of schemes they go into. So they're all farming is subsidised. So he will be getting money from the state, but he still has to make, um, he still has to feed his cows through the winter. That's the thing. So he, he will say, look, OK, give me some money and I won't cut that field, but I can't feed my cows money. You know, I have to feed them silage. And with the British weather being the way it is, Farmers tend to cut silage as and when they can, rather than just yeah. think, you know, I can rely on cutting it later. So it's a bit of a mixture of both, really. They get subsidies, but they also do have practicalities to meet. And yeah, they've got contracts so, with the market. So, <laughs> sorry to interrupt, Mary, but the, the thing that I, I, I always wonder, because um, we're, we're, whenever there's talk about conservation, the dollars are always very, very hard to get. Mm. What I what I wonder is, would it be actually a net positive if that particular farm didn't actually have cows? Mm. 
Mm. Would it cost would it cost the country any more to pay him a livelihood to be a land manager rather than a cow husbandry uh, place because yeah. it, it because we we continually hear that agriculture can't make money it needs to be subsidized that doesn't seem to me to be a long term winner it and and the emotional arguments tend to be about farmers need to be farmers well they can still be stewards of the land and do husbandry activity, but they don't have to have bovines. It's interesting, you see, because when I wrote my book, Curly Moon, about the Eurasian curly, I went for lunch. I did a big walk across Ireland and Wales and England, and I ended up having lunch with a farmer, three generations of farmer, granddad, a dad, and the daughter. And the daughter was young, and she was young farmer of the year. She was a really progressive young farmer, you know, a really successful young farmer. And having this lunch, I'd said to them, listen, if you were paid to farm for wildlife instead of your cows, would you do it? If you got the same standard of living, but you went out and you made sure that your fields were full of wildlife instead of just cows, you could have some, but nothing like the intensity, would you do it? The granddad and the dad both said 100%. Why wouldn't you? That sounds great. Um, yeah, I, I can't see any reason. The daughter, the young woman, said, "That's I'd leave farming. She said, that's not what I'm trained to do. I'm trained to get the most out of this land that I can. That's what I love. That's my way of life. I'm not a nature reserve warden. Mm -hmm. So you're up against culture. And that's why it's really important that we deal with this sensitively, because you know, we're dealing with people's histories, traditions, expectations, livelihoods. There's so much wrapped up in it. Very, very rarely is the answer to conservation a simple A plus B equals C. So that's obvious what we have to do. We have to go and do it mm -hmm. because people aren't like that. And we all live here. So it's a complicated thing to get right. Um, and so simple formulas might seem attractive, but do they they rarely work on the ground? People need options. I think that's the thing I always um, come back to, and that uh, she might want to continue to be a farmer, but uh, every village used to have a tinker and a tailor and a candlestick maker, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, but the world has moved beyond those things being uh, mainstream uh, occupations. And yeah. Yeah. and I think there's, uh, I mean, we're going to have to find new ways to, um, uh, uh, to feed ourselves because it doesn't matter which part of the world you look at, it's, uh, it's not sustainable. No. Um, yeah. um, I, either. I think you're right. But I think the transition is, is underway. Um, but I don't think it's always necessarily going to be a very easy one. So uh, as that conversation, it was a very enlightening lunchtime. And the farmer's wife, the, the mum of the young farmer, she said, look, right there, you've just heard the shift in farming. You know, the older guys just saw themselves as custodians of land. And as long as they had the land and they were working on it, they didn't really mind what the product was. But the young woman did care uh, what she was producing, and she didn't want to produce wildlife. So yeah. she didn't mind wildlife, but she didn't want to produce it. Yeah, no, I, 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 I totally get where she's coming from. I think in public policy, we again we have this this issue where anytime people want to spend money on conservation, on something where you can't actually put the product in your hand take it off a shelf, yeah. um, the conversation about dollars gets very, very, very hard. But really I, I used to be an accountant, and I can tell you most of the farms, people who were, uh, who were claiming the primary production uh, tax benefits were surviving on off-farm income. Mm. So farming was really their hobby. If, you, if you're hard-nosed about it, you would say, um, 
we don't actually need you. We like that you're out there on the land, but uh, but no, the fact the fact is that you're getting most of your income. You are you are supporting your household, and well, in most ca- in so many cases, you're supporting your <laughs> agricultural operation because you work. Uh, yeah. five, five days a week at the news agent, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's supporting a lifestyle, isn't it? A lot mm. of it is about lifestyle and history and, you know, my dad farmed here, my granddad, mm. you know. Mm. So I'm carrying on that tradition and it's a lifestyle that is supported by subsidy and um, and that's, we had it with uh-huh. the mining, you have it with mining as well in Australia, yeah. you know, the miners yeah. have their own culture. It's very hard to break the deep coal mining tradition mm. here. Very painful process. I'd, I'd just like to see the same rules about where the dollars come from and what the dollars contribute or what the dollars cost in a real sense. I'd like that that discussion to be a fair and equal one. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I, th- I think we're a long, a long, long way away from that. Well, we're right in the middle of that, aren't we, with the football super league, you know. I was just saying, wouldn't it be wonderful if there was as much passion and money in the system for wildlife as there is for football at the moment? Then we would all be very – we wouldn't be having this conversation because it would all be fine. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now, now I've, I've focused on the Far Eastern curlew and you've been talking about the Eurasian curlew. But, of course, there's other curlews. Mm. Um, how – how many of those other uh, members of the tribe are in are in your region? Do, uh, do you do you pay much attention to the wimbrel, to the little wimbrel, um, or or is there more than enough just with the the Eurasian curlew to keep you busy? Well, we only have the Eurasian curlew here. Uh, the wimbrel, the Eurasian wimbrel, it goes the north, it flies, it, it uses Britain as a sort of pit stop, really, but it tends to go further north and goes and, and nests in Iceland, and then it uses us as a pit stop on its way back to Africa again. So we don't really have any other species of um, curlew to concentrate on, but that doesn't mean to say we don't care about it. I mean, the slender bill curlew uh, was a species that nested in. Uh, the sort of tundra or the, the sort of steppes of Russia and then wintered in the Mediterranean. So that was quite close by really. Um, and that's the other species that's now considered extinct. So that was hunted out and its breeding grounds. Certainly its, it's wintering grounds, it was uh, really hunted very badly. Um, so there was a big effort to try and raise uh, raise interest in the slender build and uh, for a while people going out and convinced it was still out there somewhere but it's never been seen again um so but i love all curlews and all wimbrels so i've made a series of little podcasts myself i did one on the eskimo curlew and talked to the guy who uh convinced he saw some and um but uh him and, a, and a, he's a birder he was a professional birder for uh, for the government and he and a colleague were convinced they saw a small flock off the coast of Texas, um, but he didn't get any photos, and it's not been seen since. So, but I love all curlews, all of them. Well, maybe the Eskimo curlews that he saw were being chased by a Tasmanian tiger. You never know because yeah. because they're being seen uh, frequently as well. Uh, there's <laughs> always there's always someone who's seen a Tasmanian tiger I recently. Saw, I saw the tweets recently. Was I got really excited for a bit, and then no. <laughs> Uh, when uh, yeah yeah when I was a kid I, I I was sure that I'd go to Tasmania and rediscover it but uh, but I've 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 given that uh, I've given that dream up um, Mary the the pressures on um, shorebirds uh, in general is fairly intense of course they're migratory and uh, were World Migratory Bird Day is also yeah. uh, far fast approaching but uh, and as you mentioned a lot of the birds uh, use the British Isles as a stepping stone between their most southern range uh, and their northern breeding range Um, how how are the shores and the mudflats the estuaries um, being managed these days in Britain are they um, under threat and 
because the birds rely so heavily on them as as feeding stations, stop off points. Um, is that a big issue in conservation in Britain? It is an issue, um, certainly in some areas. Uh, say around the Solent, which is the, the the estuary down in the south of Britain that goes out towards the Isle of Wight. That sort of big river system goes out there. That um, is a hugely industrial area. Always, always, always pressure to develop industry and ports and moorings and so on. And huge numbers of water birds go there. Um, there is always talk of wind farms and quite a lot of wind farms going up. Wind uh, wave turbines talked about in the Severn Estuary, an important migratory route. So the pressures to develop this new technology infrastructure is, is certainly always a present threat. We have a very busy coastline being an island, a small island, so there's lots and lots of pressure on those waterways. I would say one of the biggest problems a lot of uh, shorebirds have is disturbance. Um, if they go there in the winter, people are always increasingly now going for walks with their dogs. Dog walking is a massive issue here um, with, you know, dogs running everywhere, chasing all the birds as they try and roost up and rest on the beaches and then sort of running through their nesting areas inland. So disturbance is a massive issue on the coast. Um, some areas are protected, but not all. And I think housing development, we're building third of a million houses a year here for the foreseeable future and a lot of people are moving out and these big developments are happening along the coast there's always pressures there's always pressures and there's always going to be this great threat of increased human population and increased demand from the land and somehow these wonderful wild creatures have to try and fit in to ever dim diminishing spaces that are multi-use they're not just for them they're for everything and so the pressures on wildlife in a small place like the UK are enormous, which makes us one of the most nature depleted countries on earth, according to the United Nations, which is actually almost too hard to say because, because it never used to be like that, but it is like that now. The view from afar, and I judge it mainly by what I see in the, uh, in the media on what trickles down from say the BBC in its worldwide coverage and whatnot that I that we get over here and and then social media like Twitter does seem to me that the the British um, population seems to be becoming more nature aware. Am I am I right there or is that just because it's all so flashy and uh, and and people with good social media skills are using the platforms? I think it's a mixture. I think there is a growing awareness. I think there is around the world in many places that, you know, things are not as they should be. The climate is not as it should be. Biodiversity is declining. So there is a growing awareness. But I think that's matched with an increasing disconnect as well from the natural world. So we're increasingly more urban. We're increasingly more technical. Uh, we spend a lot more time inside than we ever did before. And um, there's an awful statistic that British children spend less time outdoors every day than prisoners. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, so that's one other of my big drums that I bang and have been pushing forward is a qualification for GCSC, which is the qualification you get at 16 years old. I'm not sure what it's called in Australia, but... I, I, I think we call... That's the one before you do your O-levels, isn't it? No, that is O-levels, so that's... Oh, okay, so yeah. that's so that's your... Um, uh, but is that what we would call the university entrance year? No, it's the one before... No, so it's, so it's year 11 we would call it here. Yes. And then, yeah, year 11 and then... And then two years later you then do your higher qualifications before you go to university. So it's that 16-year-old okay. level, um, which we call GCSE, it used to be called O-level when I did it, called GCSEs now. Um, and uh, I've been pressing and pressing and pressing and it looks like it's going to happen at any minute now for a GCSE in natural history. So we teach young people... What, it, what nature is out there. So they know quite a lot about biology. They know what about photosynthesis and digestion and, you know, great big biological systems, but they can't identify the birds on the peanuts, you know. So we, we need to be able to teach young people what the life is that lives around them. 
get them engaged again in the natural world that they live right in amongst. And then we'll start having a much more knowledgeable, engaged, active, passionate society about the natural world. At the moment, there's concern, but there's disconnect. And that's a, that's a kind of negative space to be in. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, have you got a few more minutes, Mary? Yeah, sure, yeah. Terrific, terrific. Um, tell me about the genesis of Curlew Media. All oh, right. <laughs> For years and years and years and years, I was a producer in television and radio at the BBC Natural History Unit. Uh, then I took redundancy when I went to work with an NGO that works with world religions and conservation. And... Um, and I got interested in writing books and much more into the campaigning sort of out there activist side of things rather than just being behind the scenes all the time. Um, and that's where Curly Media, so I set up Curly Media when I left the BBC. And then um, after doing a lot of work with all sorts of things um, and getting very passionate about curlews, I did my big curly walk, which was, as I mentioned, from the west coast of Ireland through Ireland, through Wales, through England, 500 miles across the Britain and Ireland. And I wrote Curly Moon, a book about that walk and about what I found out. And all that rose, all the issues became so interesting. And I had no, I literally, when I set off on that walk, I had no idea how complicated and fascinating and scary this all is. And I got more and more interested in it. And so I set up my own little Curly charity called Curly Action, which is just over a year old now. And we're only little, but we're punching above our weight. And um, out of all the activity that I have done, but certainly others have done, not just me, um, we now have a group set up by the government called the Curlew Recovery Partnership England, which is a steering group of nine big organizations, the RSPB, the BTO, all the biggies. And they will sit around this table with the shooting organizations as well. And we're charged, really, we've given ourselves 10 years to turn this around for curlews in Britain, in, in England, and hopefully extend it out to the other countries too. So that's where we are now, and um, I'm chair of that group. So things are definitely moving, and that's what's happened to me. I've gone from being a very media person to sort of stepping out from in the shadows behind cameras and recording machines and saying, well, I think I'm going to try and do something myself. And that's where we are now. Now, I'd, I'd love to know more about your history with the um, BBC Natural History Unit because I think that's one of the great treasures of the world, really. But you just mentioned shooting groups. Now, I I would be flag flabbergasted if people are still shooting curlews. Is that a thing? Uh, not, no, it's illegal in this country. Um, it, they, it was shooting curlews and other birds became just for sport became illegal in 1981 um but there's still sport shooting in this country grouse shooting and pheasant shooting which you don't have in australia in fact i don't have anywhere else apart from in britain where i i, I don't know anywhere else where there's an industry where they breed up birds yeah. Yeah, and 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 they introduce birds. I, yeah. I I think so. They breed up introduced birds to go and re release in the wild to compete with your with your indigenous species, and then for people to blast the living suitcase out of them. Just um, I mean, there there are some things which have had their day. I think. <laughs> yep. Um... But that's that's a class issue, isn't it? Really, it's a it's a it's a yeah. class struggle issue in in the uk uh, you know everything in the uk is a class issue but it, it's um shooting is is uh has been part of british tradition and culture for hundreds of years so uh, certainly uh, pheasant shooting is is hundreds of years old uh grouse shooting red grouse shooting up on the moorlands became very popular in, from the sort of 19th century onwards um and has spurned this whole industry as you say it is an industry it employs a lot of people, it takes up a lot of land, costs about £40,000. I don't know what that is in the US, in American dollar, uh, sorry, Australian dollars anymore, but uh, £40,000 a weekend to go up there and shoot some red grouse. So, you know, we're talking big bucks and, and a lot of passion. And uh, you mentioned that sport 
um, shooting has always been a part of the uh, the uh, the the British or the UK sort of scene the his through the history, but there's been the people who were legally allowed to do it, and they all dressed up and uh, and, <laughs> and 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 owned everything, and then you had the people who weren't allowed to shoot who were doing it to feed themselves. Yeah, that's right. The poachers. So, yeah. yeah. Because so, again, it's all complicated, isn't it? It's all complicated, and and again, shooting is. Um, you know, a lot of moorland exists because there is shooting, because they maintain the habitat to breed up the red grouse. The, the, the pheasant shooting, which happens much more in the lowlands, in the woodlands of the lowlands, is more of an issue which uh, we really need to address quite urgently because, you know, 50 million, 50 million, just get your head around that number, birds, game birds are bred in Britain every, sing every single that, year. That when, when I, I was completely unaware of that until I started seeing the outrage mm. on Twitter. Mm. I could not believe that those resources mm. are committed mm. and and at the same time the woodlands you have left and uh, and the sort of grassland that is hanging on is just completely ignored. I mean, mm. this, again, is where the allocation of dollars becomes mm. insane. And I'll bet the government is contributing in some way to breeding up those pheasants and grouses. Well, it, you know, they, it's all a run on uh, private business. So, but traditionally, these big landowners had shooting parties. It's where a lot of politics was done. It's where you did a lot of your socialising. That's obviously transformed over the years. But that that history of land ownership and 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 meeting and so on and using these social occasions are still very much there now the gamekeepers that run and support all these things certainly provide a lot of other things they provide hedgerows yeah. wildflower areas seed banks beetle banks you know they copses um so alongside producing a lot of these game birds goes a, a, quite a lot of good habitat so you know it's again it's it's hard to see it as goodies and baddies you just have to the, the problem is all just too intense. We just need to scale it all back down again and stop this intensity. We don't need to produce 50 million game birds a year in this country, most of which just don't get shot and end up outside and very probably go to keeping the high numbers of foxes and badgers and crows and buzzards that we have in this country. So the supplementary feeding of these big birds who are a bit gawky and a bit naive because... You know, then they haven't evolved against up up against the predators that we've got. So, you know, it's complicated, as they say. Oh, Very complicated. Uh, definitely, definitely, and um, and I'm sure no scientific work was was ever done to look at the effects on uh, on other species before the approval was given to. Uh, no, not to before let, the approval. No. There's there's work being uh, undertaken now to try to work out. The effect of this huge number of birds is it having an effect on the number of predators in this country hmm. now you, you'd, you'd think you know obviously it is and lots of people would say well of course it is but then there are high numbers of predators in areas where we don't have game shooting so um it, it all needs teasing out and uh, you know it needs bigger brains than me to do it but we need some facts and once you've got facts and science behind you, you can really then go and hammer at the door and say, we've got to change this. But you, you can't do it on, I think this is the case, or I think that's the case. I want to go back to, to Mary and the the Natural History Unit at, at the BBC. How long were you working there and, and what did what did you do? What we or what were you you I imagine over time you had a number of roles there. So what what did you do? I had a very classic um, career there, really. I started off as a researcher, which is what a lot of people do, and climb the sort of greasy pole, uh, ended up as a producer, and um, worked on a whole series of wildlife programs, documentaries, bespoke series, um, you know, some of the, the, the bigger stuff, um, smaller films. I also have a passion for radio, like, like you do, obviously. You know, I love the spoken word, and... I worked a lot in what's called Radio 4 here. It's our national speech radio. Um, so I had a really interesting and varied career at the Natural History Unit. 
uh, worked with David Attenborough, with all sorts of things. So it was just wonderful. But there comes a time, or they did for me, um, where just this other stuff was tugging, and uh, I just want to make a difference to wildlife on the ground. Not just film it, but make a difference to it. And in the end, that won out. But it was great. It was great. And my husband's still there. So. Well, marvellous. Um, uh, we, you can't really talk about the Natural History Unit without talking about David Attenborough. Um, is he as affable uh, when, when the cameras are off as he seems to be when he's performing? Yes, of course. I mean, he's no different. He is who he is, and and that's who he is. Um, he's a very intelligent, very principled, very um, conscientious human being who uh, understands his own worth, that's for sure. But he, you know, um, is consummate storyteller. That's why he's so good at what he does. You know, he's not the greatest naturalist on earth, but he's a really good storyteller. And if you can engage people in the way you talk and in the way you present things and through your passion, that's worth so much, isn't it? And I, I think we'll lose a great, a great ambassador for the natural world, you know, come the sad day. But he's in his 90s now, so um, he's done untold good for nature. I don't think there's a better natural history um, communicator um anywhere on the planet i can't think of one uh in the americas uh i don't know about spanish speaking or anything like that but i i can't think of anyone who communicates the the need uh of the natural world and the delights of the natural world um better than uh, yeah. than yeah. david attenborough um Oh, I've got high hopes for, for Greta Thunberg. She seems to be able to attract a, the attention that's necessary, but uh, we're going to lose a champion when mm -hmm. he uh, when he's gone and there doesn't seem to be anyone about to step into those those shoes, which which I'm I'm really quite um, quite scared about because uh, those kind of programs need to keep being made so that the issues uh, on television screens worldwide in prime time all the time. I think it's, um, I wouldn't despair. I think, you know, sometimes these great trees shade out some of the little ones for a while, but I think there's such wonderful young naturalists coming through, people who are just brimming with love of this planet. And I think um, I think we'll see some great people. I, I do. Who who are some of the people in uh, uh, in your neck of the woods that people over my side or or people in the Americas uh, could could look out for? Oh, there's there's almost too many to mention. There's uh, Holly Gilbrand. There's Cab Camille Kabul. There's um, Ka sorry Kabir Cowell. There's um, Sean McCormack, there's all sorts of people like that, uh, you know, they're, they're from different ethnic backgrounds, different ages, they're just diverse, they're fun, they're full of love of nature, I mean, real love of nature. So, you know, just uh, go on to Twitter and look for British young naturalists and they'll just come pouring out of your screen. I'm really excited about the future for them. I've been mostly seeing the work of... Uh of the bird girl uh doc what does she call herself now dr maya bird girl craig i think mm -hmm. she, she got an honorary doctorate for her work so mm -hmm. um uh I've, i'm always uh smiling whenever i see her mentioned it just seems to be that gap you know da david attenborough's in his 90s <laughs> what's what's maya in her teen she's a teenager i think um, Players, um, about 19 uh, hours or something, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. there's some uh, great, great young people out there, great young people. Yeah. yeah, so what's next for you, Mary, with um, uh, with your work? Uh, are you, are you going to remain focused on on the plight of the curlew? Or uh, oh, I, I will remain focused. I've just can I look, look, is my new sure. Book? 
my new book, which is just coming out in two weeks, Beak, Beak, Tooth, and Beak Tooth and Claw. Who's published yeah. that? Harper Collins. And Harper it's Living Collins. with Predators. It's our relationship with predators like foxes and badgers and so on. I'm really interested in that. Um, I'll just keep doing what I do. I've got another book published, uh, you know, commissioned, and I'm just going to keep writing, talking, enthusing, trying to get people around the same table, talking this through and get some action on the ground. Not just words, it's got to turn into action. And that's, for me, that's the bottom line. Let's, let's, let's look forwards together and walk forwards together and then we'll make a difference. We will. Well, I'm, I'm always asking people just, you can't do everything. Nobody can do everything. Just do something. So from your point of view, Mary, if, if a, a first time listener drops in and is interested in doing something in the UK, what, what do you think is the first thing or perhaps the simplest thing that somebody can do if it's their first interaction with conservation or, um, or activism, green activism for whatever better term? I think I just have this mantra, you know, I think, no, you can't do everything. Nobody can do everything. So pick something to love and then just love it. You know, and if you love something, then you will move heaven and earth for it. But also remember, alongside love never comes alone. Love always comes with a huge dollop of responsibility and care and, you know, protection. And so if you choose whatever it is that really fires you up, choose something to love and love it and just get other people to love it and realize that alongside that comes an awful lot of work to do to protect it but if you love something then it becomes a joy it's not a, it's not it's not a problem too right too right and i i i love that idea of just um opening your eyes and looking around and seeing what you what, what you, you can love. do yeah now mary i usually ask people the the same set of questions but I don't think I really need to ask you what your favourite bird is. Because... <laughs> I do love a curlew, but I do love other things too. I really do. It's not just curlews. Curlews have become a sort of overriding passion of mine, but there's so much and so many other birds I love too. But I do love wandering albatrosses. I find them very inspiring birds. Have, have you set your eyes on one? Yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah. I've loved yeah. enough. But, so it's something like that. Um, have you got a favourite, like a bucket list location where you'd love to go and, and watch birds? I think I'd just go back to Orkney. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> Or back to Australia because I lived there for a while and, wow, is it so different. And I loved it. And I loved the lyrebirds and I loved the sort of, I know, you know, the, the beautiful calls in the morning, the currawongs and the magpies. But Grant, I'm going to have to say goodbye to you because I've got another interview which started two minutes I, ago. <laughs> oh, I, I've been watching watching my clock, and I wasn't sure if it was set with yours. Um, yeah. Mary, you'll be happy to know there's a lie about episode coming up very, very soon. Oh, well, so. I'm going to listen to that. I love yes, them. Yeah, I would hope so. Uh, Mary Cole, thanks so much. Curly Media, uh, but. Hook, tooth, and claw, or beak, tooth, and claw. Beak, beak tooth, tooth, and claw. Look out for that in in the bookshops, um, Mary. I'm sure you'll give me uh, a link that uh, yeah, sure. so that people can buy direct from you. I would hope. Um, thanks so much, Mary Colwell. It's been absolutely. I'm, I'm Grant Williams. This has been the Bird Emergency. <laughs>